Good morning. I'm Hal Harden, and we're here today in the offices of John Sigenthaler at the First Amendment Center in Nashville. Mr. Sigenthaler has graciously agreed to be interviewed uh, and, uh, by the Nashville Bar Association Historical Committee, and I'd like to thank Val and Jennings, and particularly Jason Powers, who is here uh, videoing Mr. Sigenthaler's interview for their donation of time. Uh, to summarize Mr. Sigenthaler's long career, uh, he funded the first American, the first, I want to say first American, the First Amendment Center in 1991 with the mission of creating national discussion, dialogue, and debate about First Amendment rights and values. He's a former president of the American Society of Newspaper Editors. He served for 43 years as an award-winning journalist for the Tennessean, which was Nashville's and is Nashville's morning newspaper. At his retirement, he was editor, publisher, and CEO. He retains the title Chairman Emeritus. In 1982, Mr. Sigenthaler became founding editorial director of USA Today and served in that position for a decade, retiring from both the Nashville and national newspapers in 1991. He's a former Neiman Fellow at the Harvard University. He served for two decades as a member of the Neiman Advisory Board. He left journalism briefly in the early 60s to serve in the U.S. Department of Justice as administrative assistant to Attorney General Robert F. Kennedy. His work in the field of civil rights led to his service as a chief negotiator with the governor of Alabama during the Freedom Rides. During that crisis, while attempting to aid Freedom Riders in Montgomery, he was attacked by a mob of Klansmen and he was hospitalized. He hosts a weekly book review program called A Word on Words senior advisory trustee of the Freedom Forum. He is chair of the Robert F. Kennedy Book Awards for the RFK Center for Justice and Human Rights and chairman emeritus of the annual profile and Courage Award Selection Committee of the John F. Kennedy Library Foundation. He's a member of the Constitution Project on Liberty and Security, which was created after the September 11th tragedies and served on the 18-member National Commission on the Federal Election Reform which was organized in 2001 by former Presidents Carter and Ford. He's a member of the Country Music Foundation, Board of Officers and Trustees, and a member of the Board of Directors of the Howard H. Baker Center for Public Policy at the University of Tennessee. In 2002, the trustees of Vanderbilt University created the John Sigenthaler Center, naming the building at 18th Avenue South and Edge Hill Avenue that houses the offices of the Freedom Forum, the First Amendment Center, and the Diversity Institute. The John Sigenthaler Center encompasses 57,000 square feet and includes, includes a three-story expansion that was funded by the Freedom Forum and donated to Vanderbilt. A chair in the First Amendment Studies was endowed for $1.5 in Mr. Sigenthaler's name at Middle Tennessee State University, and scholarship pro projects are endowed at both Vanderbilt and Middle Tennessee State in Mr. Sigenthaler's name. He's the author of a biography, James K. Polk, which was published and released in January of 2004. He's a strong advocate of the First Amendment rights of free expression. He has also been a nationally recognized critic of willfully falsifying and misleading online vandalism. His controversy with Wikipedia for posting anonymous libel statements led to that website revising its policies. Also, know or I've heard that when you were in high school you won a speech contest. Is there any truth to that? There's truth to that. Once or twice? I think I won it twice, but I certainly won it, uh, I certainly won it, uh, I think I won it my junior and senior years in high school at Father Ryan. And word has it that your grandson recently won a similar award. Any truth yes, to that? Yes, he's, uh, he's at uh, Johns Hopkins as you and I speak and, uh, and pursuing uh, that as a result of his SAT scores, which were exceptionally high. <laughs> At one time, John, you were voted, uh, according to some polls, as one of the most powerful men in the southern United States. And I think that principally had to do with, with politics and, and obviously your, your journalism. I'd like to concentrate today on your association with the legal profession, both in Washington and in Nashville. Uh, but before that, let, let me ask you a few background questions. Uh, tell us a little bit about your mom and dad. Well, my father was a, uh, 
building contractor who uh, focused uh, largely on uh, heating and uh, and roofing, um, and uh, he started very early something called the OK Tin Shop, uh, which was on Bridge Avenue before I was born. Uh, I was born St. Thomas Hospital at a time when we lived on Woodmont Boulevard. Uh, my father, uh, during the war, during World War II, went on a contract to Oak Ridge and uh, spent several years there, coming home on weekends. My mother was a secretary for the state, off and on, throughout the years. She had eight children, but still found time. And I didn't know this until um, I had introduced Pauline Gore, Senator Albert Gore's wife and vice president's mother. I introduced her at a function some years back, and she said, um, told the audience that my mother had helped Albert, her husband, establish the Employment Security Department in the state of Tennessee when he was, uh, I guess in the Browning administration was uh, uh, Commissioner of Labor. Um, you know, I was raised in a very happy home, uh, big family, big Catholic family. Uh, you know, you... Uh, because I was the oldest, I uh, got most of the desserts, and, and uh, but I really uh, I, we had a we had a great uh, upbringing. My parents were thoughtful, uh, exceptionally well read. My father and mother read to me every night uh, my formative years. Uh, long before I started the school, they were reading to me. Uh, my mother started with the junior classics and then moved into Shakespeare by the time I was about nine or ten. My father would read Tom Swift or the Rover Boys. And, um, and I really uh, had a, what I'd have to call a happy childhood. It was depression period. Uh, there were tough times uh, for every family and ours included, but it was basically a uh, a family upbringing. I'm still exceptionally close to my siblings. Uh, we're a loving family, and uh, uh, unlike some families, we've just managed to avoid any and all arguments uh, over over the years, and we we spend a lot of time together. And there came a time when you met this young, beautiful musician here in town, Dolores Watson. Tell us about Dolores Watson. Well, Dolores Watson was an uh, outstanding uh, vocalist uh, with, uh, with uh, both radio and television outlets. She uh, started in Rome, Georgia. That, uh, she, uh, she was born in Kentucky, in Lexington, but her uh, family moved to Rome, Georgia, where she began to sing while she was at Shorter College. And she then... Um, she then uh, was asked to come to Nashville by WSM after she'd won some national award that resulted in a trip to Cuba uh, before the Castro regime. And so she came, to, um, she came to Nashville, and not long after that, um, she found herself singing in New York with Arthur Godfrey. Uh, and... Uh, in Nashville, she sometimes sang under her own name when she was singing pop. Uh, she sang under the name Penny Davis a few times when she was singing country. She she uh, she appeared with uh, Eddie Arnold on his uh, trips across the country. She appeared with Chet Atkins. She had a very early uh, drive time uh, half hour show. It was called Dream Time with Chet Atkins. Chet played the guitar, and she handled the uh, singing and the master of ceremonies uh, challenges. Uh, Chet in those days was sort of a silent personality. Um, but she had one great career. She was on uh, regular on Sunday Down South. She was a regular on The Waking Crew. And I would guess 
the first five years we were married, her income was probably five times what mine was for each year for five years, and uh, she was uh, she was a real star. Well, now the waking crew was uh, for those <clears throat> who may not know was it was an early morning program on WSM. Uh, started like at five thirty in the morning with the the price of hogs and the weather forecast, and they had live music. John McDonald, John did, McDonald. The, uh, did the early morning farm show, That's and right. then the Waken Crew. Uh, the Waken Crew uh, came on after McDonald was off, and I, I, you're right, he was on from 5:30 to something, and Waken Crew went on just about drive time for morning. And then he traffic. hung around for the noon report to give. A That's report right, on and the then she was she also sang on the uh, noon show, and. Um, uh, with Teddy Bart, with Teddy Bart, with Dave Overton first, first. and then with Teddy and, and with Collins, uh, hmm? and then with uh, was there an announcer called Collins? Uh, yeah, Judd Collins. Judd Collins. Yeah, and Judd was most often on the noon show, and uh, so Loris uh, was on the noon show with Judd. She was on the Waken Crew with Dave, and later with Teddy, and uh, she had a terrific, uh, terrific career. Wonderful. And she was with Elvis Presley on some show. She warmed up Elvis, warmed up the crowd for Elvis at the Tupelo homecoming. We went back for the 50th anniversary of that uh, last year, and there is a there is a documentary on that homecoming. And uh, <clears throat> she uh, she told a wonderful story about how she got up to introduce the crowd. It was at the state fairgrounds at Tupelo. And, I mean, people were hanging off the bleachers. I mean, it was a packed house. And um, as she began to sing a couple of opening numbers, uh, people in the audience began to shout out at her, where is Elvis, where is Elvis? She finally said, listen, I've got to get through these two songs. He's back there. He's wearing a purple shirt. He looks absolutely beautiful. But you're not going to get to see him till I get through. <laughs> And they all uh, applauded that, mm -hmm. and uh, and Elvis came on, and uh, I had a I have a great picture of the two of them together backstage uh, that day, and uh, uh, she found him to be a, a very talented guy, and uh, at, you know there was some concern about. Uh, Elvis's homecoming. Colonel Tom Parker worried that Elvis and his mother had lived on the wrong side of the tracks in Tupelo while his father was in prison. And Colonel Parker called Dolores and asked her to sing that day uh, in order to give a pop tone to the program. I had Papa John Gordy's uh, uh, Dixieland band to give a Dixieland approach, and the Jordanaires were to sing hymns and back up for Elvis. So it was a diverse program because he was worried that the people might not welcome this young star who had come from the other side of the cracks while his, tracks while his dad was incarcerated. Uh, but the people just poured out and... Uh, uh, it was interesting. Kids ran up on the stage. Women, young women, ran up on the stage, and some were arrested during the afternoon performance. Colonel Parker called out the national guard. I got the governor, who was there, uh, to call out the national guard to protect Elvis during the evening. And uh, those, also, that was great publicity. Yeah, that's right. So you you had a son, John Sigenthaler, uh, Jr., John Michael, right? As some people call him, and. You started him out early uh, in journalism. As I recall, you sent him to the uh, State versus William Powell trial in 1969. What was his duties at that trial? Well, we needed someone in the Powell trial. We had decided that uh, Haney Gurley, who had been shot to death, uh, and Bill Powell, who was charged with the shooting, was his partner in uh, Chevrolet dealership, and the interest in it was high. Haney Gurley was a very popular uh, citizen. Uh, he had a son named Billy, and uh, the question was who was going to 
on the dealership after Haney, who was quite advanced in age, uh, gave it up. And Haney had decided for a long time that he wanted to give it to Bill Powell. Uh, Bill Powell, uh, pretty well known himself. He'd been a Vanderbilt football player and was well liked in the community. And and uh, but Haley, uh, Haney and Bill, uh, according to the prosecution, had a dispute that led uh, Powell to kill him during a ride back from lunch. And uh, it was such a, a, a stunning case that I decided we wanted to run every word of the trial in the paper, which was unheard of. Uh, and, but we did run every word. And I needed someone who could, uh, some young uh, copy boy who could run copy from the courtroom whenever there was a break to our office so that we could stay ahead of the stay ahead of the uh, of our deadline on getting all that uh, copy in on the trial and uh, it was a great experience for John Michael uh, he came to know great lawyers and uh, came to love uh, the law and to love journalism before we get off that trial have you ever heard of another trial like that where they we printed verbatim the transcript, the daily transcript of what occurred in court? The only precedent was one uh, just after the turn of the century in Nashville, and I don't remember the style of the case, but it involved a uh, it involved a murder. A man, a very prominent man, murdered his mistress, uh, and I forget what that case was about. But I knew it uh, quite well because. Uh, we reported at the time that this was the only time it had been done in so many years, you know. And then John Michael went on to become a, a national anchor person on, on TV. He did. He was, uh, first of all, he was here. Uh, he uh, worked in uh, production in television at the outset at Channel 2. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, Channel 4 then recruited him away from Channel 2, put him on camera as a reporter and later as an anchor. I think one of the most frightening times of my life. Uh, he was in one of those pools. It was a prison riot. And uh, all the reporters who were there wanted to go, and he was the pool reporter who got to go into that, that violence-ridden, uh, state penitentiary uh, to interview the convicts and that was his first first I think his major scoop uh, as we call it and then uh, he um, had a talk show on Channel 4 and then was recruited away by Seattle uh, and he went to work in Seattle where he met his co-anchor who turned out to be his wife Carrie Brock and uh, and then soon after that, uh, MSNBC was beginning, beginning, and NBC took him away, and he worked at MSNBC for a couple of years and then became the weekend anchor for NBC News. And as a little guy, we'll call Jack, and we'll get back with him uh, in a moment. Jack that. is the son of John. <laughs> Jack's the third John, mm -hmm. but we call him Jack for identification purposes, and he's uh, brilliant. Well, and, as, uh, and may be headed for the law, I must say. Well, as uh, John J. Hooker Jr. said a few months ago, uh, that he might be president of the United States. <laughs> that's right. Any truth to that? He did. Well, that's exactly what Hooker said. And, uh, <laughs> Hooker missed uh, when he predicted he was going to come, become president of the United States. <laughs> but he might be right about Jack. Aside from your family, uh, what, what do you think was one of the most influential things that happened to you in your early career? I think that uh, I think that early in my career, uh, it was very clear. I went to work at the Tennessee in 1949, and went through that regular routine. I began writing obituaries and sort of news release handouts that you checked on. I uh, used to say that I over 
over the first couple of years. Uh, I've probably buried more people than Philip Robinson Funeral Home. Uh, <clears throat> and then I also covered the police beat and came, became friends with many police officers who uh, I continued to know throughout uh, their careers, uh, including Joe Casey, who became uh, the chief of the police department. Uh, I had a very good relationship with police officers, uh, except occasionally when it was necessary to write negative stories about them. Uh, but I, I think that uh, during those early years, particularly being involved in the police department, uh, with the police department, uh, I began to look at um, race as a real problem uh, in the South and in Nashville. Uh, police uh, cases uh, involving brutality uh, was a problem occasionally. And um, while I had a good relationship with police officers as sources, I um, I really, uh, looking back on it, had a feeling that it was during that time that so the nagging of social conscience began to get to me a little bit. Uh, I remember one terrible experience. Uh, I was in the booking room. Police officers were uh, very open. To me, it was a lieutenant named Ted Nanny who was on every night, and he gave me free run. And I was in the booking room, and there was a there was a, uh, a wire screen that separated uh, the booker from the person being arrested. And uh, there was a police officer named Buford Hill who'd had a bad accident in the line of duty, and they put him behind that screen to take care of people who were being arrested and the other members of the police department were separated from. So Buford, uh, who had a crippled leg, uh, was there. One night, a uh, city councilman named Bob Lillard, who was also a distinguished lawyer, later a judge, Bob Lillard came to the police department to get out of the police department uh, one of his employees, he had a filling station in a restaurant, and walked into the uh, into the office, and Nanny said to him, uh, Councilman, we're getting your man out, and if you'll just go around to the booking room, uh, Mr. Hill, Buford Hill, will let him out. And so Councilman Lillard walked into that booking room, and Buford Hill, who was slightly drunk on duty, saw him wearing a hat and uh, spouted the N-word and said, take that hat off, and smacked him with his open hand, <laughs> knocked his hat off, and uh, I was astounded. I wrote a story about it. Uh, the city editor in those days who had, had, was a veteran whose father years before had been a police detective, Jack Setters. And I called the story in. I mean, it was a sad thing to do, but I was sitting there looking at a police officer attack a city councilman. And uh, I called Lillard for a comment. And he said, well, I don't really know what you're talking about. Uh, Mr. Hill's a friend of mine, and I don't know what you're talking about. I wrote the story and quoted him, uh, what he said, and turned the story in. And Jack Setters called me and said, uh, I, we're not going to run this story. And I said, I was mad about it. And I said, why not? And he said, well, I just called Bob Lillard myself, and he says, he don't know where you were. This must have been some invention on your part. 
and they didn't run that story, and I was offended by it, uh, and I made up my mind, as far as I was concerned, there's never going to be complicity between me as a journalist and and the story that I had to cover, and I made up my mind I was not going to be a city editor like Jack Setters. Uh, and that's what, just one of a number of incidents that that drove me. I th I think if you asked Hal what uh, what was my what what was a guide that helped me formulate values, I think it was reading. Uh, because my parents had both read from me to me from early age, I I. Uh, I became an avid reader, and uh, and I remember I was in high school at Father Ryan, and my math teacher I was I was not a good math student, and my math teacher one day stopped me in the corridor, not in class, and he had a book. He said, "Singthal, I'd like for you to read this book." He'd never spoken to me outside class before, and I don't know what it was about me that made him give me this book, but it was a book called The Mind of the South by uh, W.J. Cash. And uh, what Cash did was really analyze, I think, his own mind uh, and the minds of men of his generation as they looked at race. Uh, and I read it, and I think for the first time I saw uh, for myself, uh, just a glimpse of how we were and why we were the way we were. And he talked about how blind we were, protected we were by uh, the older generation from the reality of discrimination. And I think that as a result of that, uh, I have no idea why that priest uh, a Franciscan gave me that book. Didn't help my, it didn't help my math grade to read it, but I talked with him about it, and uh, it made a difference. And it's, it's amazing, even all these years later, to think back about why this man, who never had a word with me outside class, maybe he talked to some other professors or something, so I saw something I didn't, but gave me that book, and and that book led me to read other books uh, on the subject. And I wanted to find out about why we were the way we were. And, uh, and you know, it was not maybe another year I was reading uh, County Cullen and Black Poets, uh, Langston Hughes, uh, along with a, lo a great deal of other reading. But uh, I, I, I really attribute my devotion, and it wasn't, it was really a, a, a passion for reading that made a difference. I remember reading a book, a next next book that really made an impact uh, in the field of race. It was a book called The Foxes of Howard. It didn't have anything to do with race. Uh, it, was a, uh, it was written by a man named Frank Yearby. I didn't know anything about Frank Yearby, but Foxes of Howard was a great movie. <clears throat> and... I got the book before I saw the movie and read it, and it was gripping. And uh, uh, after I got through with it, I asked my mother about Frank Yearby, and she knew about him, and she said he's a Fisk graduate. And I said, um, I had read on the cover jacket, I said, why is he living in France? And I think for the first time she said what she should have said often because it was intolerable to live here in Nashville and to be have a sense of pride. And what she was really saying was he'd gone to France because he was black and simply couldn't tolerate uh, as talented as he was uh, the treatment that was uh, automatically doled out to African Americans. Well, John, in your career, starting off as a, as a cub reporter, 
uh, covering the police beat, you've had occasion to meet some of the best and the worst, I suppose, in, in the legal profession. I want to ask you about a few of those guys I know that, that you've met and that you knew, and both locally and in Washington. Uh, who was Bobby Lee Cook? Bobby Lee Cook was an Atlanta lawyer, uh, very talented. Uh, and the thing that appealed to me about Bobby Lee Cook was that he loved journalists and was not above going off the record to talk to journalists about cases he was working on. And um, uh, we became good friends, and he didn't have many cases in Nashville. But when he came to town, I usually heard from him, and we went to dinner and or to lunch. And, and uh, he was always a, not only a great lawyer, but a great source. I, I remember one time he had a case before Judge Tom Higgins in federal court. And I ran into Judge Higgins somewhere. And I said to him, how was, how, how was Bobby Lee uh, in this case? And Judge Higgins said, if you can get beyond his ponytail, he's a wonderful lawyer. And that sort of says something about not only Bobby Lee Cook, but also about Tom Higgins, uh, who was a fine judge. And the, the TV program, Matlock, was patterned after Matlock Bobby Lee Matlock was patterned after the laugh of Bobby Lee Cook, that's right. Who was John Hooker Sr.? John Hooker Sr. was, I think, maybe uh, the, one of the best lawyers in the country. Uh, how can I judge that? But I, I think that... He was a man of power and passion and, uh, and great natural talent. Um, and I thought that, uh, that he, uh, by the time I was covering the courts, after police I didn't cover the courts, but by the time I was covering the courts, uh, John Hooker was mostly uh, in civil practice. <clears throat> he rarely showed up in criminal court. Um, but occasionally he'd be in federal court and I'd cover a case there. But I also covered uh, a couple of trials in which he uh, defended in, uh, in the criminal courts of Davidson County. And uh, when he came, or when his friend and competitor Jack Norman came. When they were defending cases, uh, the courtroom would be packed, not with spectators, some would be spectators uh, who were just ordinary citizens. Lawyers flocked to hear Norman and Hooker uh, defend a case. And if they knew that either of them was, was involved, and the word would spread, I mean, maybe the first half of the first day, the jury selection, uh, you'd have a half a house. Next thing you know, it's standing room only. And uh, those, uh, John Hooker Sr. Uh, and Jack Norman were contemporaries and uh, most often were, on the, on, uh, were not competitors, but there came, came a time when they were. And... Uh, th th any time they were in court, it was a monumental, monumental uh, experience for a reporter. I mean, just wonderful to be able to go in there and watch them perform. Um, well, then you, you, you hired Mr. Norman to be the Tennesseans' counsel, did you not? <laughs> uh, he had been hired by Silliman Evans Sr. Okay. And uh, he and in those days, uh, when I was a reporter, we had as our counsel, both Jack Norman and Cecil Sims. I didn't know it at the time, but Mr. Evans had also hired Z. Alexander Luby. And uh, we never called on him for anything. He advised Mr. Evans. I didn't find this out until years later, that Luby had, that Mr. Luby, the distinguished black lawyer, had been on our payroll. But it says something about Silliman Evans, I think, uh, that he did that, and, uh, and about his two sons, because they continued to employ Luby until I was editor and publisher and beyond, and uh, but but you know you're a reporter and you're working on a tough case, 
and you're worried about getting sued, and you've got to go to a lawyer and ask advice. And it was my policy always to go to Jack Norman as opposed to Cecil Sims. Mr. Sims was a wonderful man and a great lawyer, but he wanted to think through uh, a story for three or four days, and by the time you hear it back from him, I mean, the story was no longer there, you know. Norman would take you immediately th over the jumps. Uh, can we prove this? If we get sued, what's the evidence? You tell him. Here's what the guy... And most often he'd say, go ahead, son. We're all right on that. Because, you know, I had done due diligence, had talked to everybody I needed to talk to about it, and so I had a great relationship, and most of the reporters had a great relationship with Jack. We admired and respected uh, Cecil Sims, but frankly, uh, we stayed away from him when we needed approval uh, on, a, on a story because it was, it was tedious to get a decision from him. And later on, you were represented by, by Bill Willis and Al Knight. By John J. Hooker, Bill Willis, Al Knight, Henry Hooker. Uh, that was a young law firm that was hired by Eamon Evans with my strong recommendation. And, uh, and they were terrific. Uh, I think Knight is probably the best First Amendment lawyer I ever saw. John J. Hooker, Jr. had uh, many of his father's qualities. Uh, he was, uh, some people called him flamboyant. I never thought of him as flamboyant, but uh, before a jury, he could be quite passionate. Bill Willis was the ultimate, uh, he was the ultimate uh, support piece for for Hooker. Bill Willis was thoughtful, careful, understood not just the law, but understood uh, how to read jurors, uh, how to read judges. Uh, you know, it's a different world, as you know, Hal, in the courtroom. It's, it's not a world that people outside really get much chance to see or, or understand unless you're a juror or unless you watch one of these trials that's now occasionally telecast. I mean, you don't get a real sense of, of, of the business of the courtroom or how it works, and you don't understand that human dynamic. You've got jurors sitting there uh, who uh, have said they don't have an opinion about the guilt or innocence. Probably they do have a hint about it, some of them. Uh, then you've got the judge who's sitting there as 13th juror, as the arbiter, and who uh, tries to make it fair for both sides. No judge wants to get reversed, and you make a mistake, and that's where you go. And, and, uh, and in the days I was a reporter, the judges that uh, were presiding over the course, uh, Judge Leon Gilbert and Judge Chester K. Hart, were wonderful men. And they called the Attorney General General, and they called the Defense Counsel General to be equitable. <laughs> and I always knew that they did that uh, as a policy. And one of the things that that policy entailed was um, worrying about how to address black lawyers and the effect that it might have on jurors, uh, most of whom in the early days were racist. Uh, don't want to be unfair, but it was just an absolute fact. No blacks on the juries, no women on juries. I was in court one time with Judge Gilbert when a young, young woman said, I really want to serve. And he said, well, uh, your, your presence here is a mistake on the part of the, part of the clerk's office, <coughs> and uh, I'm going to excuse you. And she said, well, judge, uh, I want to serve. And he said, well, it's not the policy of us to burden women with, 
with this challenge. And she said, Judge, I, I, I'm a citizen. I want to do my civic duty. And he let her. She sat in on that case. And, and others later, that whole policy changed as time passed. But uh, no blacks on the jury, very few women uh, in those days when I was covering the courts. And, uh, and the show was really between the competing lawyers, the prosecutor on one side uh, and the defense lawyer on the other side. And it, it, was, uh, it, it, it was a drama. It was, it, was, it was like theater. And if you covered it well, uh, every day there was another drama unfolding. And, uh, and the outcomes of those cases were always of high interest. And, in those days, we covered cases on a continuing basis, uh, and so I, I had a, I had a great good fortune to spend a couple of years covering the courts and getting acquainted with the lawyers, uh, with Hooker, with Norman, uh, particularly with Jack Norman, uh, who was my friend, uh, and with uh, and with J. Carlton Losa. Joe Loser, who was the district attorney. Tell us about him. Uh, Carlton Loser, whose old friends called him Joe, was uh, he was the epitome of dignity and credibility uh, and propriety. There was nothing about the way he looked or talked or acted uh, that was anything but appropriate, proper. Uh, never once in all the days I knew him as a, as a prosecutor and later as a congressman, never one time did I ever see him act in anything but a, uh, a proper and appropriate way and in a dignified way that uh, earn the respect of people who knew him and, and saw him. Came a time uh, in Congress when uh, he lost a race uh, that was contested, and uh, he didn't come out of that uh, quite as well as he might have. But <clears throat> when he was a prosecutor, he he had great assistants. One of his assistants was A. B. Neal Jr the son of the Chief Justice of the State Supreme Court. Um, in the other court, uh, the days I was there, first it was, uh, first it was uh, R.B. Parker, I think, and then uh, Howard Butler. Uh, maybe vice versa, maybe that flips a little bit. But they were, uh, they handled most of the cases in those courts. Loser picked his cases. When Losa came to court, it was a major event, and and if if Hooker or Norman uh, or one of the other uh, really effective lawyers, uh, there were two others that deserve to be mentioned. Uh, they really, I didn't think, were in the class of Norman or Hooker, but Carl Harden and Frank Taylor were two criminal lawyers uh, who were into all sorts of antics uh, that were beneath most most lawyers, but uh, but they were very effective and tough, and uh, and but Norman usually I'm, I'm sorry, but uh, but Losa usually stayed away from the court unless there was. Uh, unless it was a major case, or unless uh, the lawyer for the defense was, uh, unless the lawyer for the defense was a uh, was a giant, and he matched wits with the giants. <clears throat> Just one case to mention, uh, sort of make the point. Uh, I was a young reporter. Uh, and the police, the detective chief was named Martin Stevens, and he was withdrawn. 
rarely got his name in the paper, usually didn't want any exposure by the press, and had a very chilly relationship with reporters, had including me. One night I was in my little cubby hole there at the police department, and uh, I saw him come down the stairs from his side, walk across the corridor, and up to my little office, and came in and shut the door, and said, I have a story for you. And he took a picture and gave it to me, and said, this man's name is Howard Thomas Wallace, and he's known across this nation as the man uh, who robs gamblers. And uh, he said he's robbed Marcus Hackerman, who was numbers racketeer, at his home. And he said he uh, he uh, robbed a gambling game in the back back room of one hundred Highway One Hundred Dinner Club. Well, I'd been to Highway One Hundred Dinner Club many times, <clears throat> and was not aware that uh, there was gambling going on in the back because it because the fellow who was running the gambling was a guy named Jimmy Washer who had a downtown uh, operation, a club, and uh, police had been given him careful scrutiny, and he just moved out to his brother-in-law's restaurant and set up this game in the back, in the back room. And anyway, Martin Stevens said, this is who this guy is, and we're looking for him all over the country. And nobody has had a story about Hackerman or Washer being robbed. Well, you know, here was a fellow handed me a major scoop, which, which I covered. And uh, shortly after that, I was covering the courts, and Loser uh, said he had read my story on Howard Thomas Wallace and that they had captured Wallace in West Virginia robbing a safe in a gambling house. And uh, he was going over and bring him back. He, the district attorney, was going over and bring him back. And that sort of tells you who Howard Thomas Wallace was. I mean, he was really an effective uh, criminal, but he also was urbane and witty. Uh, and uh, when he robbed the gambling house, uh, my recollection is, and Marcus Hackman, he had a woman with him who joined in the robbery, but he had other colleagues too. So anyway, I went over with General Losa to West Virginia and uh, brought Wallace, rode back with him on the plane, and um, he then prosecuted, he personally prosecuted Wallace, who got the best that uh, money could buy, John J. Hooker Sr. And uh, Losa tried that case, and Wallace was convicted. And I, it was the first time I had seen <coughs> Hooker against Loser. And the thing I remember about that case was Hooker's final argument, knowing Loser was going to come right behind him. And he wanted to prepare the jury for what they were going to see. And he said, now, you're going to hear from Joe, my old friend, Joe Loson, our district attorney, he's a fine man, but uh, I just want to let you know in advance that you're going to see a lot of crocodile tears flow. And Joe is famous for shedding tears during final argument, and uh, we haven't seen any of his tears. I mean, he made a point that Losa was going to weep. And sure enough, about halfway through the closing argument, Losa, the prosecutor, said, now my colleague has criticized the fact that occasionally I am moved by uh, these cases, thinking about the victims and how they suffer, and, uh, and then, it, he, then tears start flowing. And he says, but I will tell you if the day ever comes when the district attorney can't weep for justice, can't weep for those who've been abused, 
killed. Uh, I mean, it, <laughs> and I thought, you know, goodbye, goodbye, Howard. You're going, you're going to penitentiary, and of course he did. <laughs> what about uh, Tommy Osborne? Tommy Osborne was one of the most attractive, uh, one of the smartest lawyers I ever knew, and had been very kind to me when I covered cases in which he was defending. Uh, and I liked him a great deal. He was in line, I think, to become president of the Bar Association. Maybe he was on the board of directors of the Bar Association. But he was really attractive. Uh, he was tall, slender, uh, good-looking, well-spoken, understood the law. And uh, I had uh, covered a case uh, in which he uh, had defended. And uh, during the course of that trial, I had become close friends with him and uh, liked him a, a great deal. <coughs> he, uh, I think he had uh, the admiration and respect of most of the members of the National Bar who interacted with him. And uh, then, of course, he represented Jimmy Hoffa <coughs> in, uh, in the first trial in Nashville. And, uh, and Jimmy Hoffa corrupted him. And uh, Tommy, unfortunately, uh, tried to reach a juror with money. And uh, as a retrial, was being prepared for, I mean, the, the, the jury in this case, in Hoffa's trial, was a hung jury. And uh, so as they were preparing for, for the retrial of the case in Judge William Miller's court, um, Tommy had an investigator named Robert Vick, who was investigating jurors. And Vick told Osborne he had a cousin on the jury. Um, and Osborne, after some conversation, asked Vick if he could reach the juror and if he could tell him it'd be $5,000 if he got on the jury and 5000 more if he hung the jury. And uh, unfortunately for Tommy, Robin Vick was wearing an FBI agent's wire approved by Judge Miller and his colleague in federal court, Judge Frank Gray. They uh, had heard from a federal investigator named Walter Sheridan that Vick had come forward and said, they're going to ask me to to uh, fix this juror, and they put a wire on him. Actually put the wire on him twice. The first time he went in, it didn't work. But it was tragic to sit in the courtroom and watch Tommy sit there in pain and listen to him uh, talk to Vic about, should we step out in the alley uh, and have this discussion, or, uh, well, no, let's don't worry about that. Uh, telephone's not bugged, and uh, but of course, one of the participants in the conversation was wired, and uh, the language of the bribe offer was just uh, clear and and cogent and unmistakable, and uh, so uh, that afternoon or the next afternoon, Tommy was called by Judge Miller and Judge Gray, both of them. Had a hearing with him. Uh, he denied uh, He denied involvement. They played the tape for him and disbarred him from federal courts. And of course, a great career was shattered 
then uh, I had I had uh, a really interesting experience. I had covered the courts, and now I was working with the federal government with Attorney General Robert Kennedy, and we were traveling around the world. And we reached Japan and were welcomed to Japan by a State Department executive. And within the first 30 minutes, I told him, I've seen you before. Where have we met before? And I'm standing there by the baggage rack, and I look at him, and suddenly I realize that's Tommy Osborne. And his name was David Osborne. And I said, David, do you happen to know a lawyer in Nashville, Tennessee, named Z.T. Osborne, Tommy Osborne? He said, yes, my brother. Know him well. And uh, at that time, Tommy was not representing uh, Hoffa. Later, when... Tommy did sign on with Jimmy Hoffa. I wrote David a letter, and I thought it would have been inappropriate for me to say it to Tommy directly, but I said to David, be, tell Tommy to be careful. Uh, and David wrote me back and said, my brother believes that every client, no matter how disreputable, deserves... Uh, legal representation. I mean, he really scolded me a little bit, and uh, I never heard from him after Tommy's uh, sca the scandal uh, resulted in his disbarment. But it was a sad and tragic event. And uh, Well, for future listeners, Jimmy Hoffa was one of the most powerful men in the nation was. at the time. Jimmy, Power, uh, Jimmy Hoffa ran the Teamsters Union. And the Teamsters Union uh, had been under uh, a fellow from Seattle named Dave Beck. And a congressional committee on which Robert Kennedy was chief counsel uh, investigated Beck's background, and he and his son were both indicted, removed from office, went to penitentiary, and the natural heir to Beck was Jimmy Hoffa, who uh, was in Michigan and headed what was called the Central States Teamsters Union. Uh, he was a vice president, and then he ran to succeed Beck as president. Um, it was reasonably clear that, uh, that Hoffa was corrupt. He... Uh, it was well known that he never dealt, never wrote a check, always dealt in cash. And there were stories that uh, he had uh, that he had taken money from uh, had taken money from employers, but you couldn't. There was no evidence of it, you know. Except I. Uh, uh, General Losa, uh, his record uh, in terms of his public perception of it was outstanding. He was seen as a man of great integrity. And, but there was a bar association investigation of the office. Uh, and uh, a lawyer named Ferris Bailey, Ferris Clay Bailey, uh, and his committee found that uh, in a number of cases, Loser had not prosecuted uh, with the fidelity that the committee thought would have been appropriate. Uh, it was a big story. I remember writing the story when when that came out, and I remember talking to General Loser about it. And his point of view was, well, that's what they have found, and we'll correct that. Uh, the result of that was that my editor assigned me to go into these cases to find out uh, what was what had happened in these cases and why they hadn't been prosecuted, and that sort of launched me on a two-year crusade uh, to expose problems 
in the Teamsters Union, most of them in Tennessee, but some nationally. And, and uh, I've written a long uh, uh, essay on those cases, but, uh, but it all resulted in Hoffa being uh, tried in uh, Hoffa being tried in federal court here for uh, what was called the Test Fleet case. <clears throat> Test Fleet was uh, not something I had known about when I was a reporter, but I got a tip from a lawyer, a business lawyer, who said you should check the Secretary of State's office on a corporation called Test Fleet. And, you know, I was busy. I was working on other stories involving the Teamsters. And finally I got up there, and the only thing you could tell was that it was a Michigan firm. Man didn't mention Hoffa's name to me. And that it was, its officers were two women, uh, Josephine Poswack and Alice Johnson. And their headquarters of the corporation was a law firm uh, in Detroit. And uh, I took a look at it, and I didn't find anything there. Much later, I, uh, much later, months later, I discovered that Josephine Poswack was Mrs. Jimmy Hoffa and that Alice Johnson was the wife of Owen Burke Brennan, who was Hoffa's uh, colleague in the labor movement in Detroit. And this company had been set up to settle a strike. And these two women were given checks on a regular basis uh, from commercial carriers. Uh, and and what, <laughs> what the business was, they hauled cars, you know, new cars. You see these trucks on the highway with three or four or five cars on them. They gave, the, commercial carriers gave that business to Josephine and Alice. And it was, you know, it was, it, it was on that basis that Hoffa had settled a strike and commercial carriers gave him this operation. Well, uh, because it was a corporation registered in Tennessee, uh, Robert Kennedy decided to try him in Tennessee. And uh, by that time, I was the editor of the paper, and there were suggestions that uh, the newspaper had crusaded against Hoffa and that he couldn't get a fair trial in Nashville. And uh, we took the position editorially that if he can't get a trial in Nashville, try him somewhere else. But he was tried in Nashville before Judge Miller. And the interesting thing about that case is that it resulted in four separate subsequent trials, not involving Hoffa, but involving other people, four separate trials uh, in which people tried to reach jurors, the Hoffa case. Um, and uh, the result of it was uh, that in three of those cases, there was a conviction and one there was an acquittal. But it was a massive effort to corrupt the administration of justice during that trial. And uh, the interesting thing was that uh, Bob Kennedy, I knew he had called me and said, uh, you know, you've got this problem down there that they're saying you're going to railroad offer in the newspaper. Uh, I know I don't have to tell you. Uh, what your responsibilities are as a journalist, but for God's sakes, I hope we don't have a mistrial because of coverage. And I said, "You're talking to the wrong guy. Uh, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna, uh, you know, I'm 
know, I'm not going to beat a dead horse and revise everything I know. Uh, he called Jimmy Stallman, the publisher of the Banner, and unknowing to Bob Kennedy, uh, Stallman put his secretary on the extension and took down verbatim Robert Kennedy's admonition and, and hope that Stallman would do the right thing and not prejudice the jury against Hoffman. And uh, Stallman, deeply offended, wrote a front page editorial and the transcript of his conversation with Bob. And uh, so anyway, I, there was a, the Attorney General made an effort to make sure that that uh, that Hoffa got a fair trial, and that it was not a there was not a, a mistrial. Uh, he knew Judge Miller's reputation for fairness and integrity, and uh, the last thing he wanted was a mistrial. The efforts to fix the jury uh, had gone on during that trial, and then hung jury. I think seven to five for acquittal. And uh, they then decided after Osborne's scandal broke and after the judges disbarred Tommy Osborne, you couldn't try Jimmy Hoffa again in this town. Uh, you know, the, his lawyer, looking ahead to the next trial, had, had, had been disbarred for trying to bribe a juror. Uh, in the coming trial, and so, so there was a mistrial, and Judge Miller and Judge Gray both decided to transfer the case to Chattanooga, where Judge Frank Gray, I'm sorry, Wilson, yeah, Judge Frank Wilson, uh, where Judge Frank Wilson presided, and uh, and that's where the case was tried. The first case uh, was prosecuted by. James F. Neal uh, and a man named Charles Schaefer, who was a Justice Department lawyer, came down. They did an excellent job, but uh, Robert Kennedy felt after that trial that what was missing uh, was enough local flavor. Neal was a very young lawyer and had been in the Justice Department trying uh, criminal cases, and he was as much identified with Washington in that courtroom as Schaefer was. And so uh, in the second trial in Chattanooga, uh, Robert Kennedy employed John Hooker Sr. as a special prosecutor, and, uh, and Hooker and Neal together were the first lawyers to convict Jimmy Hoffa. He had been tried three times during the Eisenhower administration, and uh, uh, had been acquitted. And uh, he was yet to be tried again and convicted of ripping off the Teamsters Pension Union Fund. That was a Chicago case, but it was uh, it was it was a uh, that trial in Nashville was. Uh, was exceptional for the efforts to reach jurors. Uh, there was one woman who lived down in the country somewhere, her husband was a highway patrolman, and two Teamsters officials showed up at the house early one morning before dawn and, and uh, offered him a promotion. I don't know how he ever would have gotten a promotion from the Teamsters, but they said they had could assure him that if that if she uh, hung the jury, that he'd get a promotion. Well, uh, Judge Miller uh, excused her from sitting on the jury, as he did about four other people during the course of that trial. The efforts, the massive effort to uh, reach the jury in that case. Uh, is what re resulted in those four additional trials that I mentioned. All, uh, not the Osmond trial. The Osmond trial was different, but there were four trials in Davidson County. Uh, three, as I said, ended in a conviction, one an acquittal. All because 
defendants had tried in some way to reach the Hoffa jury during that case. And Tommy Osborne tragically took his own life. And Tommy Osborne ultimately went, went to prison and took his own life, tragedy. Well, I remember the last time I saw him, he was out of prison, mm -hmm. and I was at, uh, in a restaurant at Highway 170, and uh, I'd had lunch with a couple of people. And I was coming out, and Tommy had been drinking heavily and said, sometime I wonder if I could come talk to you. And I said, any time to talk. And he said, I have a lot of things that I want to talk to you about. He said, I remember the letter from you wrote to my brother David. And uh, I said, fine, love to see you. But I never heard from him uh, before. Weeks were gone. He took his own life. Well, John, tell me if there's any truth to this story. Uh, uh, legend has it that Jimmy Hoffa called Jack Norman and wanted Jack Norman to represent him. And Mr. Norman at that time was at 213 Third Avenue North. And he was looking out the window across the street to 219 Third Avenue North. And <clears throat> Hoffa supposedly said, Well, if you won't represent me, who will? And at that time, Tommy Osborne happened to be coming to his office across the street, and Norman said, I think I know who could represent you. True story. And uh, the thing that's true about it is, uh, the thing that, that's, uh, that's, that makes it unique is that uh, uh, Jimmy came in person to see Jack. Uh, I think with Haggerty, his uh, Detroit lawyer. And um, and yes, it's it it is true that uh, he asked Norman to represent him. And Norman had already been contacted by uh, Robert Kennedy to talk about the case. And and Jack Norman had met Robert Kennedy in 1960, and had become friends with him. And I think Jack Norman had a clear understanding of who Hoffa was and what was going to be involved in that case. And he did uh, see Tommy across the way. And he did recommend him. And I can't remember whether it was that day or the next day, uh, Hoffa called and objected. And uh, Norman had been special prosecutor in a case in which three members of the Teamster Union were tried and convicted of assaulting and shooting at a non-union driver. And Osborne defended that case, and Norman prosecuted it, and I was a reporter covering it. And uh, Osborne did a great job, but Norman was a powerful prosecutor and convicted those three guys. And my understanding is uh, that when Hooker, I'm sorry, when Norman rec recommends Tommy Osborne, uh, Hoffa checks and then maybe the next day calls and says, uh, why would I get him? Uh, he lost a case. And Norman said he lost the case because I was prosecuting, and I was there, and he's as good as you can get. And uh, <clears throat> just a little insight uh, in, that, in that trial in which Norman is prosecuting and Osborne is defending. There, these three union members had shot into this truck and then caught this fellow at Malone's restaurant and scrambled his eggs, really beat him. And now they're being tried for that. And Norman's prosecuting. And, the, and there's a major crowd there. It's a big case. And in the hall outside, there are jurors. Uh, Judge Hart, I think, expected a big, big uh, a, 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 an ongoing trial, and he knew he was going to have to have a big, a, a full 12 members plus some alternates. And during, and so there was an overflow, and 
jurors were in the hall outside waiting to be called and examined on voir dire. And so, uh, and so Norman comes into court after a recess and said, if your honor, please, I understand that there is a business agent named Ralph Vaughn who's out in this corridor uh, talking to jurors about this case. It's highly inappropriate, and they think he's a juror, a prospective juror. And so Judge Hart said, well, let's get him in here. And Norman gets him in there and puts him through, I think, one of the most devastating cross-examinations I ever saw. I mean, he really. and. He frustrated Red Vaughn to the point that finally Vaughn said, well, Mr. Hook, I tried to answer your questions. I don't know what to tell you. And in a voice you could hear in heaven, Norman shouted, why don't you try the truth for a change? <laughs> anyway, the result was Norman had convicted him, and Norman tells Hoffa, uh, I know about that case. And the reason you should get him is because uh, I can tell you he's an able lawyer, and you can be absolutely sure you'll get best representation you could get here if you don't get me. <laughs> and so Hoffa went for Osborne, uh, who was in a law firm headed by Lackey. By Lackey. Um, and it was, uh, his fall was tragic. What about the, the Osborne trial? The, the lawyers involved in that were Norman and Hooker, and who else? Jack Norman always, I think, felt guilty afterward. Um, he knew what Hoffa was. I mean, really, the truth of the matter is that's the reason he didn't want to be part of that case. And he knew that the Detroit lawyers would be dictating to the Tennessee <laughs> lawyers and trying to move them and trying to get them to do things that they didn't want to do. And, <clears throat> and, um, and I had talked to him about the three cases the Eisenhower administration uh, had brought and failed to convict Hoffa on. So, um, Norman, I think, understood uh, and felt bad about having put Osborne in Hoffa's sights. He felt, you know, if I hadn't told Jimmy to go over there, Tommy wouldn't have been the lawyer who was corrupted. And he felt an obligation, I think, to defend Tommy Osborne as a result of that. And um, he and Lackey were friends. And uh, I think Lackey came to see him and asked him to do it, and Tommy asked him to do it, and he agreed to do it. He didn't want to do it because it was going to be a, it was going to be a rough trial. But that trial of, of Tommy Osborne is one of the classic trials that I am. Uh, this community will ever see. Uh, you had these two great powerhouses, Jack Norman and uh, and John J. Hooker Sr. Uh, and it was a it was a it was a uh, it was the ultimate human drama. Tell us about the final arguments in the Osborne case. <clears throat> well, in the, in the Osborne case, you had these two giants, Jack Norman and John Hooker Sr. Um, John Hooker Sr. had gone to Chattanooga and tried Jimmy Hoffa before uh, Judge Frank Wilson. And with Jim Neal, they had convicted Hoffa. And a number of his co-defendants who had tried to fix the jury in Nashville. 
and they were convicted. Now, uh, now there are the Nashville trials from the people who tried to uh, reach the jury in Nashville, and one of those, uh, one of those, of course, was Osborne. Um, it was a tough trial. The uh, chief prosecution witness was uh, Robert Vick, a uh, former city police officer who had a checkered career of sorts, and Osborne had employed him to uh, research potential jurors, uh, as defense lawyers quite often do. And uh, Vic had worn the wire that that nailed Osborne. And Norman focused his cross-examination of Vic uh, on his checkered career. And uh, totally discredited Robert Vic as a human being. When Norman got through that cross-examination, uh, you didn't want to be around Robert Vick. And you couldn't offer him any, <coughs> anything except uh, a sense of contempt for uh, And Norman even went so far as to suggest that, uh, that Vick had really fished Osborne, had gone looking for this, and then it had come to the government. And um, so Jack uh, really ruined him, his credibility on cross-examination. And Hooker had reconstructed it some simply by saying, uh, you did wear this wire. And this is Mr. Osborne's voice, and it is your voice. And he did make that offer, um, which sort of didn't help rebuild Vic's credibility, but it did remind the jury of what had happened and that Tommy had tried to fix the jury. And uh, so now you come to final argument, and Vic is as much on trial as Osborne is, and and Norman's, uh, Norman's closing argument uh, on behalf of Tommy Osborne was brilliant and tough-minded. And uh, it was his last great argument. Uh, not his last great defense, but his last great argument. And, and you have to think about Hooker and Norman. I mean, you can't have that much talent, and you can't have the spotlight on you that many times without having something of an ego. And they were two proud men, loved the law, and truly, I think, uh, liked each other. Um, amazing to me how those two could go to each other and then sit down afterward and have a drink and talk about it. Um, or could run into each other six months later and reminisce about it. But at any rate, Norman gets up to close, and obviously he goes after Vic. <clears throat> and um, he took the jury through this cross-examination in which he had blistered Vic and demeaned him and made him out to be a terrible liar. And there comes a moment in that argument when uh, Jack Norman says uh, that the year before he and his wife Carrie had gone to Europe uh, and while there had visited the Louvre and had gone through the Louvre and observed the works of all the great masters of art. And uh, 
said he noticed something that bothered him but couldn't really identify it until he came uh, until he came, came to in the visit to the Louvre and then he remembered what it was and he went back and looked a second time and what he was looking at were 12 different portraits of Robert Vick I, I'm sorry 12 different portraits of Judas Iscariot who had betrayed Jesus uh, for 30 pieces of silver. And uh, Norman said, I went back and looked into the faces uh, and saw how the great artist's history had depicted this great criminal. Anyway, he leads up to the punchline, which is, and every one of those paintings look just like Robert Vick. I mean, it would take your breath away. You just sit there, if you've never heard that story, to sit there and listen to Norman tell it. He was not only a great orator and a great lawyer and a great man, he was, he was a great storyteller. And he took you with him and carried through there, and then he took you back by himself to look at those portraits. And uh, <clears throat> I heard that argument. Uh, I went up because I wanted to hear it, as, and the courtroom again was just packed. Uh, standing room outside. After it was over, I went out, and Walter Sheridan, who was chief investigator for the Justice Department, uh, was there, who had who's about half of his life had been dedicated to investigating Jimmy Hoffa. And he was, Walter was absolutely certain that Osborne was going to walk, that, that nothing anybody could do could overcome that. And uh, so Hooker got up and... Uh, he began by scoffing at Norman's story. And uh, he understood the power of Norman's uh, presence and the, and the presentation he'd made. He knew that he had to knock that down. So he congratulated Norman on this wonderful story he told. He said, yeah, I remember the first time you and I ever heard that story, Jack. We were together down in I think he said Judge Wally Smith. I can't remember whose court it was. And some other lawyer had told this story on defense. Absolutely cut the ground out from uh, because this other lawyer years before had introduced Norman to the story about everyone looks like Robert, everyone looks like Jesus, Judas Iscariot. So, I mean, it, it, uh, he began with that and... Uh, and there was out there was there was there was laughter in the courtroom um, and Norman suffered and then Hooker went on to say why he had gotten into it. Norman had made it clear that he'd gotten into it because it was an obligation to a young man that he'd had a role. Uh, in placing his de as defense lawyer for Jimmy Hoffa. And Hooker's now going to tell you why he got into it. And he says, I, it, 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 this has been our life, Jackson. Uh, this is the Temple of Justice. This is our cathedral. This is where we worship. Uh, I'm paraphrasing, but that's the theme. Uh, his life, my life, will mean nothing if this, if the, if the, if the ermine is tarnished. If if uh, if if you can undermine the judicial system, uh, we've got no hope. And uh, fine young man, uh, I watched his career, uh, and uh, I wish he'd never seen the day that. Uh, Jimmy Hoffer 
came in touch with him. And, but he said, I, I, before taking this on, I had to, I had to examine my conscience about whether I wanted to do it, and I did not want to do it. And then he, at one point, got out on one knee and said, I prayed at night. Uh, I, I, I looked for this cup to pass. I prayed at night, and finally I decided if, if this temple means anything, uh, we must make sure it's not tarnished by bribery or scandal. And he closed with, uh, by focusing on Tommy's direct quotes on tape, which the jurors had heard. And I didn't have any doubt then when I walked out that they were going to convict him. Powerful argument. It was, you know, you, I think back on uh, all the court cases I ever sat in on, maybe a hundred, I don't know, over those long years. But I never, I never heard an argument quite like that. First of all, Jack's Norm, Jack's, Jack Norman's argument, uh, it blew me away. I mean, it was just not the story about going to the Louvre. I mean, it, it, it was his decimation of the character of Robert Vick that was so effective. Uh, and, and, you know, I think those jurors could have gone out and would have been perfectly happy uh, to go out and convict both Osborne and and Robert Vick, but it was a uh, it was a uh, it was Hooker's closing argument was the most uh, most powerful argument I ever heard. Well, John, you, you've also known a lot of, <clears throat> in addition to judges and lawyers, you've known a lot of of, of U.S. attorneys. I mean, for example. Uh, your friend Jim Neal was, was U.S. Attorney. And before him, there was a Kenneth Harwell here. Did you know Jim, Did you know Kenneth Harwell? I knew. Uh, all sorts of <laughs> stories have abounded as as to why he left that position. I mean, it was essentially. I mean, the U.S. Attorney is appointed by President, and during the Kennedy administration, he was relieved of his responsibilities. He was allowed to resign. Allowed to resign. What do you think happened? I know what happened, uh, and it's a sad story. You ever told anybody about it? <clears throat> I've told a couple of people, but not many, maybe two, three. But it's not the first time I've repeated the story, but it's the first time I've ever uh, put it on the record. But I uh, was the editor of the paper and received a call at home on a Saturday from a businessman who uh, meddled in politics a great deal. Uh, his name was H.E. Flippin. And he called me at home and said he knew it was unusual and he knew he was uh, he knew he was imposing but that he wanted to come see me and talk to me about an urgent matter that he did not want to talk about uh, anywhere that might be judged public. He didn't want to talk about it at my, at my office. He wanted to see me there. And he said he had Andrew Doyle, Judge Andrew Doyle, a city judge. And he wanted to bring Doyle with him. And I said, of course. So they drove out. We were living on Fox Hollow Road then, and this would have been quite early after I came back as editor. And. Uh, because we only lived there a couple of years, and he, the two of them came out, and um, Judge Dahl said, now before I begin this, I just want to be absolutely clear that I'm talking to you off the record, because I don't want trouble with the U.S. District Attorney, and I don't want the federal government and the FBI having some animus for me and come and looking into my life or my court. And, uh, but, but what's going on should be stopped. 
and uh, by that time I'm anxious to go forward with it. I want to know what the secret is. And I said, sure, I'll, I'll take it off the record. And so he recites this story about how he is one of the clerks in his court, a black woman, was the brother of a numbers racketeer. Uh, the numbers racketeer was about to be sentenced in the federal court, Judge William Miller. And <clears throat> Doyle says, the sister, his clerk, tells him, Doyle, that Kenneth Harwell, the U.S. attorney, didn't want her brother to go to prison, wanted him to be free, but um, seems to me that numbers right his first name was Boist, Buist, um, but but they didn't want him to go. It might be Buist Reardon. Didn't want him to go, and uh, but thought it was inappropriate for him to come in after convicting him and ask the judge to let him go free. And he had suggested to <laughs> Numbers Racketeer that he go to the doctor, and he recommended by name the doctor, and it was the doctor for Judge William Miller who had a heart condition. And he said, you get that judge to you get that judge uh, letter from his doctor, your doctor, saying you've got a heart condition and uh, it'll have an impact. Judge Miller uh, respects this doctor and, uh, and uh, if that's done, I'll be able to say out of a matter of uh, sympathy, you're a sick man, I'll be able to say, uh, Judge, I, I, uh, I'm, I'm perfectly at I feel perfectly comfortable recommending a fine, but no jail time, which is what what the racketeer wanted. And uh, so they're telling me this story. And uh, I said, well, I'm, you've taken me off the record. I can't run it in the newspaper. Uh, I'm a journalist of my word. If I give my word, I'm going to keep it. But I can't do anything about it if you don't swear to the truth of it. So we took him from the living room into the, my library den, and I t typed uh, on a portable typewriter um, his story, the affidavit, and how he found out about it. Uh, and uh, I then called my secretary at our home in Donaldson and asked her to drive to my house. And Judge Doyle signed it and flipping witnessed it. And she uh, signed it as a notary public. She no notarized it. And on Monday, I caught a plane, took the affidavit to Washington, and left it with Robert Kennedy. And the FBI conducted an investigation and found other evidence of misconduct on Kenneth's part. And uh, Dick Lansden, fine lawyer in Nashville, represented Kenneth and negotiated with the Attorney General to let him resign. And that's what happened. Kenneth resigned and stepped aside. As far as I know, no, nobody really understands why. I think he told, I think Kenneth told uh, Estes Kefauver, who was his great sponsor and had promoted him for the job, I think he told Cindy Kefauver, uh, but I don't think he told anybody else. And I don't think anybody besides uh, uh, Flippin and Andrew Doyle, uh, the three of us, I think, were the only three people who knew exactly and, what was working. And just for the record, Flippin was one of the most powerful 
ward healing politicians that's ever been known. He was a businessman who ran something called Clark Hardware. Clark Hardware. And uh, he was deeply involved with Mayor Beverly Briley and his campaign and his administration and was involved in making recommendations for people for jobs and promotions. I mean, he was a, he was a businessman who meddled in, in local politics and uh, enjoyed it. And, uh, I later, uh, much later, <laughs> uh, had a team of investigative reporters uh, try to prove that or try to find out if Flippin was, say, selling guns to the police department or uh, benefiting himself. And we turned him inside out, and uh, he was obviously very, very careful about what he did. Uh, he was complaining about uh, Kenneth because he thought Kenneth was dishonest. Um, but most people, raised questions about flipping, and because of those, I really tried mm -hmm. to find out about him later than this. I thought it was pretty impressive that that he wanted uh, this change made. I never really understood what motivated Flip. I never really understood uh, what motivated Doyle to tell him, because as far as I knew, they were not close at all. But Flippin had heard this, and then the FBI, in investigating Kenneth, found out some other, found some other uh, inappropriate uh, actions on his part, and it all contributed quickly to his resignation. Well, when he resigned, uh, obviously there was a vacancy. Was did Jack Kennedy then appoint? And that's when Neal? Jim Neal. That's when Jim Neal came in to fill in for uh, that unexpired term. And Jim was U.S. Attorney, uh, and he was succeeded by Gilbert Merritt. Uh, and Gil served as U.S. Attorney for um, throughout uh, Lyndon Johnson's presidency. Um, and then he was succeeded, I think, by Charles Anderson. Charles Hill Anderson. He was there for eight years. Eight years. Uh, was not a friend of yours. I, I, uh, I never understood it. Uh, we were, uh, we thought he was a good U.S. attorney. Praised him from time to time. Criticized him maybe a couple of times. But he made it absolutely clear to me and to others that uh, it wasn't that he just didn't like the newspaper, he didn't like me. And uh, he, he said the uh, paper was on fire, he wouldn't spit on it, put it out. And uh, So I, you know, I, I never knew what Charlie's problem was with me. After he left the office, uh, he and I had a civil uh, relationship, but but while he was in, in the U.S. Attorney's office, he really wanted anything to do with me. And, and I don't know. I don't know what that had to do with it. It may have been that he felt I was too close to Jim Neal and too close to Gil Merritt, uh, who were his predecessors. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, I, uh, I can't remember when Joe Brown came in. Joe was hired by Charlie. Yeah, um, and succeeded, I guess. That right? No, I, I'd su I, I succeeded Charlie. You succeeded Charlie. And did Joe Brown succeed Then I asked Judge Morton to appoint Joe Brown as acting yeah. U.S. Attorney when I resigned. Oh. Joe, I think, served with That's Charlie right, yeah. Three or four years. Now, I had a very good relationship with Joe Brown. Uh, still do. I thought he was awfully good. My problem with Joe Brown was that he would absolutely never give a reporter the time of day. He wouldn't talk to a journalist uh, on any subject. And you know, there are times, you know, as a former U.S. attorney, uh, you have, you know, if you're going to keep the people involved about 
what's going on in that office, you have to be willing to talk to journalists. Now, there are things you can't tell them, won't tell them, some things you tell them off the record. But, uh, but I, I think Jim Neal had a great relationship with the press. I thought, uh, I thought Gill had a good relationship with the press. I thought Charlie had a good in, a relationship with the Nashville Banner, but not with the Tennessean. You obviously uh, uh, confronted Sometimes. some <laughs> moments when, if you hadn't kept the press advised, uh, the public would have been poorer for it. Uh, but Joe Brown wouldn't talk to anybody. And uh, absolutely, you couldn't. You couldn't, under any circumstances, get Joe Brown uh, to talk to the press. And I don't know whether he didn't trust us or didn't trust himself, but that was a, for the journalist, that was a, you had to get it somewhere else. At one time in the late 70s, there was a young girl, a Vanderbilt co-ed, that was kidnapped, Ned Adams, from the Vanderbilt campus. And... <clears throat> We had conversations back and forth that the kidnappers had supposedly said, you let this out and we're going to kill the girl. And you and the rest of the media, locally and nationally, didn't run for that, with that story for 48 hours or so. Right. More than that. More than that. Has that ever happened before? And could it happen again? No, it never happened before, but it could happen again and should happen again. And I was, and I made the decision after you told me that her life was in jeopardy. Uh, I made the decision that we wouldn't go with that story because it would be a risk to her life. But I also remember saying I want to be advised on a continuing basis of what's going on. Because if the threat passes, I'm off the hook on this, and we're going to run it. And, uh, I, I, you know, there are times when the press and the prosecutor just have to cooperate. And that was one of those, and that was one of those moments. And I thought you all handled it with such great integrity and, and didn't leave us in the dark. I mean, the FBI... We set up a command post outside Absolutely. the courthouse that's all right. night long, and every hour gave you a briefing. Is that yeah, right? That's right. And the other thing I remember about, and I didn't ask for, I didn't ask for anything the rest of the press wasn't right. going to get, but I, was, I think I was the last person called because when you called me, you told me the three television stations and the banner uh, were going to be silent about this. And... It's not surprising they were. A woman's life was going to be at stake. But I wasn't sure. I mean, the FBI can exaggerate conditions sometimes, and so can the police. And uh, it's a little difficult for the U.S. attorney to do that. You know, he, I mean, I, you, you know, all prosecutors at one time or another gild the lily with the press. Uh, but we were talking about a life or death situation here, and I said, finally, that uh, as long as I was advised on a continuing basis, and if I trusted your candor. So it worked out very well. The other thing I remember about that case was a decision as a journalist to write, to publish the fact that she was raped. And the rule inside the media was then, and in many news organizations is today, that you did not run the name of a rape victim. Not ever. Uh, and, uh, and, and defense lawyers constantly criticized us for that, criticized me for that. And they would say, my client, this is mutual consent. Uh, and my client is not a rapist. He had sex with this woman, and you've taken his name and run it, said he's been charged with this crime of sexual assault, and you don't run her name, and it's unfair. And, you know, you have to look into it very carefully, and you have to conclude that rape is, 
is a crime that has its own unique impact on victims. Uh, and it was on that basis, and after talking to Otto Billig at some length about it, about the psychiatric problem, that I decided we would never run the name of a rape victim. Now, uh, here's a kidnap victim, and nobody knows she's been raped until she's, she's sitting in the witness box. And I guess you all asked her. I can't remember exactly how that came about. But I remember the reporter who was covering the trial came in and said she was raped. And we had a big, uh, big uh, conference in the newsroom about, uh, in the news meeting that afternoon about whether we weren't obligated since she had testified in open court to say that she was raped, and we did say she was raped. Put it way down in the story, but it was there. And I just always had the feeling that anything that happened in open court, if it was of news importance, you had to report it. And I think the understanding, I mean, you know, clearly, clearly she was a victim of kidnapping, but I, I think our argument was you, you're not going to understand. If, the, if, this, if this jury, if, if the decision in this case is, is uh, severe punishment, then the uh, public ought to understand everything about what the kidnappers did to her. How did you get to know Robert Kennedy? Uh, I covered, uh, I, I was covering the Teamsters Union in in Tennessee, and uh, there'd been a number of cases, the Test Fleet case I talked about earlier. Uh, once I got into some of those cases that Ferris Bailey suggested that General Losa had not uh, had not gone into, uh, a number of those were Teamsters Union cases of assault. And, uh, I, I had, ex had had worked on that almost for two years when the Senate Rackets Committee started its investigation, and they sent me to Washington to cover that and to cover Washington for a period. Uh, came a time when Robert Kennedy and John McClellan, the chairman of the committee, senator from Arkansas, decided they were going to do a week on the Tennessee case, uh, largely based, uh, as they said in, the, in their report, on what I had found. Uh, interesting about Tess Flees, because I don't think I knew who Josephine Postwack was until after uh, the McClellan Committee got into it, and they said, oh, yes, that case was settled. And then I told them about Tess Fleece, and they said, that's Hoffa's wife who got that money. Um, but anyway, another case involved, uh, uh, there was another case in, in which Norman was a special prosecutor, in which a man uh, named Frank Allen, uh, who ran a, who ran a, uh, trucking company out of here for a uh, parent company in Atlanta, and he would not let drunk uh, anyone with a drunk driving conviction drive a truck. And he had an argument with a business agent who demanded that he do it and then almost beat him to death. And Norman was called in to prosecute that case. And I won't belabor it, but Frank Allen then decided he would not prosecute. Uh, this union slugger, a fellow named Smith. And Norman got up and said he was embarrassed that his client wouldn't appear. We went out into the hallway, and I was all over Mr. Norman saying, what is this? You've got to tell me this. I mean, I, I know how badly he was beaten. I know uh, that they hired you as special prosecutor uh, because they wanted to make sure there was a conviction. And uh, so I, 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 I pushed it a little bit. And so now Robert Kennedy has got that case, too. And it turns out that 
Hoffa had asked this man's employer, a fellow named Joe Katz from Atlanta, during a union negotiation, asked him to get Frank Allen to drop the charge. So that was one of the things the administration, the, the, uh, the uh, committee was interested in. The other thing was um, the, the payments to Judge Ralston Schoolfield, $20,000, in Chattanooga for fixing a case for eight teamsters who were uh, indicted for uh, criminal conduct, uh, including assaults. And he was impeached for that? In Chattanooga. And he was, in, he was impeached and convicted, removed from office. Norman that, was the prosecutor. For that. <clears throat> so anyway, uh, the committee has this week on the Tennessee cases. And uh, Robert Kennedy was, I didn't realize it, but he was particularly impressed. I had uh, given all my stories to the investigators. I just might, I think it might be of interest. My first meeting with Robert Kennedy was a disaster. And my second meeting was not much better. Uh, I had gone up as an investigative reporter to lecture to the American Press Institute on investigative reporting at Columbia University. And uh, it was suggested by my editor that I make some overtures to Robert Kennedy about looking at what had happened in Tennessee. Uh, Coley Harwell thought it was worthwhile to get the nation to take another look at this and, and let them know uh, what had happened, a uh, judge had been corrupted, uh, you know, the rest. So, uh, so I went up to do this lecture at Columbia, and when it was over, I arranged through uh, Sergeant Shriver to have a meeting with Bob. And I, he was in Foley Square in an office in there. Uh, at that time, he was investigating a fellow named Squalanti who was involved in the uh, uh, garbage union in uh, New York. And when I walked into the office, I had a meeting with him at 12.30, I walked in at 12.20, he was standing by the window with his top coat and a scarf on and a hat, one of the few times I ever saw him wearing a hat. And uh, there was no f friendly greeting. It was, you're late. You're 20 minutes late for this meeting. I said, no, I'm 10 minutes early for this meeting. The clock there on the wall. I was due here at 12.30. And he said to his assistant, Angie Novella, who later became my good friend, who would lie for him, well, what time was he here, uh, due here, Angie? She said, 12 o'clock, Bob. And I said, well, I just happen to have a note here from Sarge Shriver that says 12.30. And he said, without smiling, well, Sarge is on Central Standard Time. He's always confused about these things. And he turns me over to his assistant, a guy named Adlerman, who was terrific. I leave all the stories I've written with Adlerman. Adlerman goes through them. We spent three hours together. Adlerman says, Kennedy's got to see this stuff. He's got to know what you've got into and the, and the questions that are still unanswered down there. Uh, and... Uh, so I said, well, I'd be glad to come back. He said, well, we're going to be in Washington next week. Is it possible you could fly up to Washington and meet with Ken? I said, sure. So he arranges the appointment. I show up a week later, and I get brushed off again. And I went home thinking he was uh, a rich little shit. Is That's the term I used to describe Robert Kennedy. Uh, and I came home after the second failure, second discussion with Adleman, uh, convinced that uh, I didn't want to have anything to do with him. About six weeks go by, and I get a call from city editor that says, Siegenthal, there's somebody pretending he's Bobby Kennedy on the phone wants to talk to you. And I got on, he says, Bob Kennedy, I want to talk to you about these stories said, Jerry Adleman's been pushing me to read your stories, and I just got a chance to read them all this weekend, 
and uh, I'm sending two investigators to Tennessee tomorrow. Could you possibly meet them and give them some background on some of these stories? And I was, I was cool. You know, I was really, I'd really been offended by the rich little shit. And so, but then he began, I said, what do they want to talk about? And then he got into specifics. Uh, tell me whether, as a witness before our committee, Frank Allen would be a good person to call. Or uh, tell me about uh, this lawyer who was in Schoolfield's case, uh, the district attorney down there, would he be a good one? You know, and, and he clearly had it. He clearly had everything I had. He understood it, and he thought it needed further investigation and exposition. And... So I'd say we talked a half hour, 45 minutes, and I said, yes, I'll meet with them tomorrow. And they flew in, and I met with them, and uh, one's name was Jim McShane. You uh, later became chief U.S. marshal uh, for the country, and the other's name was Laverne Duffy. And um, they were very effective investigators. The result of it was that week of hearings, well, um, then the next thing that happens is I'm a Neiman Fellow at Harvard, and my classmates wanted to know if I could get them, if I could get Jack Kennedy and Bob Kennedy to come at different times and meet with our class and talk about politics and public policy. And both of them came, uh, which made my me very popular with my classmates. But Bob, during his visit, uh, which was in November, said, next month, Christmas, can you and your wife come and visit my family for Christmas? And so Dolores and Jack, uh, Dolores and John Michael and I went down for Christmas and on the morning I left, we had early breakfast, and he said, look, I'm getting ready to write a book, and I'd like very much for you to write, to help me with this book. And uh, could you possibly extend your leave for six months? So I called Coleman Harwell, and that was agreeable to him, and there was a lot more money than I was going to make as a reporter if I did it as a book, and we signed a contract, and contract said I got a bonus if it went to the bestseller list. I don't know how many copies this old man bought to put it on the bestseller list, but I got my bonus nonetheless. Um, the book shot to the top of the bestseller list. First week it was number two on the New York Times best bestseller list. I mean, it was, it was a good book and won great reviews. And uh, so he and I, during that six months, lived together at his place at Hickory Hill. Family was gone for four months to Hyannisport, and we bonded. We became close friends. I had thought we wouldn't. I thought there would be arguments about the book, and we'd get tired of each other, and, but we didn't. We became close friends. And <clears throat> so then, uh, following year, uh, I'm back working as a journalist, and he is directing his brother's campaign. And he calls me pretty early on after Jack announces and asks me if I'll come to work in the campaign as his assistant. <coughs> I told him I couldn't do it. Uh, I'd, I'd been away for a year and a half, an even fellowship, and working on the book, and I really couldn't do it. Then Coleman Harwell, our editor, was fired, and a new editor was employed. Um, part of what the paper had done that I'd been part of was cover civil rights, spec uh, uh, particularly during the, the sit-ins. Uh, and uh, the new editor announced that we weren't going to cover civil rights in that way anymore that the Associated Press could uh, cover it for all out-of-town stories and that he thought 
David Halverson and Wallace Westfeld and I had been manipulated by the students in the movement. And so I, I decided I was going to leave. And at that point I called Robert Kennedy and said, is the offer still open? He said yes. And I said, well, I'm going to cover the convention in Los Angeles and two weeks after that I'll give them notice as soon as that's over and two weeks after that I'll come to work for you. And that's what, um, that's what I did and uh, left and went to Washington and uh, lived in an apartment in Washington with, after I got there, John Hooker decided he was going to join the campaign. And uh, he came up and we, we uh, lived Junior, together. Are you talking about? We lived together in, in Washington during the course of that campaign. And uh, uh, we rented Ross Bass's apartment. Senator Ross Bass? Senator Ross Bass was then a congressman. He was on leave. And uh, I mean, he was in Florida during that campaign. And so we lived there. And, uh, did and you get I along with Hooker that, as worked. well as you did Kennedy? Hmm? Did you get along with Hooker as well as you did Kennedy? I got along with, <laughs> with Hooker great. The thing I remember about John Jay, and you'll get a different story of this if you talk to him about it, but when, when Schofield was about to be impeached, Frank Clement looked at what the McClellan Committee had done investigating uh, Schofield and appointed Jack Norman to... Uh, prosecute, be special prosecutor, investigate Schofield, and if the evidence was there, impeach him and try to convict him. Um, Norman had great relish for that case. The um, system had been corrupted and he felt about it always, just as Hooker had expressed it. I mean, it was his temple and so he accepted that. Then he began to be concerned that Schofield would employ Hooker Sr. as his lawyer. And Norman never told me this, but he then employed John J. Hooker Jr., who was in his father's law firm, uh, as his assistant. And that that headed Hooker Sr. off at the pass. I don't know whether Schofield ever made an approach to John Hooker Sr. He ultimately was represented by lawyers from Chattanooga. Anyway. Quite a compliment. Yeah, real compliment. But um, at any rate, uh, the impeachment of Schofield went forward, um, and I covered it. And... Um, it was a wonderful experience because during the House impeachment hearing, the story of corruption unfolded inside the legislature. And they had a side uh, effort to, they had to appoint an investigating committee to look into another scandal in the legislature in the middle of the school field impeachment. But anyway, he was impeached and he was convicted uh, I think he was impeached on maybe 16, 17 counts and convicted on three and removed from the bench. And so Robert Kennedy had come down and testified in the trial against Schofield during the uh, removal phase of the impeachment. And uh, I... I think that uh, he was uh, he was impressed that there had been a follow-up to what the committee had exposed. I mean, we had taken that case as far as it could go. There were things I didn't know and couldn't find out, Tess Fleet being one of them who Pozuak was. I could have found out, but didn't. Uh, the other, I mean, there were other things that the committee was able to get into. I could put $1,500 on school field from the Nashville Teamsters Union, the Chattanooga Teamsters Union, but Hoffa had signed a check for eighteen five, 
to make the $20,000 payoff. And uh, the committee got into that. But, you know, I think I came out of uh, that experience, uh, that Schofield impeachment, uh, with uh, Kennedy's high regard. And so, uh, so I went off the next year to the Neiman Fellowship, then worked with him on the book, then went to work after. And I was not the only one left to Tennessee in. Uh, Tom Wicker left over the change in policy. David Halberstam left. Wicker and Halberstam went to the Times. Uh, Dick Harwood went to the Washington Post. Uh, I think first the Louisville Courier Journal. But anyway, there was a basic bailout. Wallace Westfelt went to work for NBC News. We all wanted out of there if we weren't going to cover the second revolution, the second American revolution that was unfolding on our on our streets, and so we all bailed out, and Kennedy was where I went, and had the job offer, and, and uh, I stayed with the administration for 18 months, at which point Eamon Evans had become publisher and called me and asked me to come back as, as his editor. I remember that. When he called me in Washington, uh, I was getting ready to take a trip with Robert Kennedy around the world. I mentioned the, the intersection with David Osborne, Tommy Osborne's brother. But I was getting ready to leave on that trip. I had already advanced it, and Eamon wanted to know how soon I could come. And I said, I'll come two weeks after I get back from this trip around the world. And so I tripped trip around the world with Robert Kennedy, and when I got back, I was, I, I immediately came to Nashville to become editor of the Tennessean. And you mentioned Sergeant Shriver. He was the first director of the Peace Corps. He was, he was. Jack Kennedy's brother-in-law. And he did a good job of recruiting people for uh, the administration. Some of the people that Robert Kennedy hired in the Justice Department were people that Sarge helped recruit. And um, it was the father of Maria yeah. Schwarzenegger. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's right. Uh, Maria Schreiber, that's right. It was Sarge's uh, daughter. Well, you were with Bobby Kennedy virtually every day for a long period of time. Where were you on, on, on June the 5th, 1968, when you heard the news that he'd been shot? Uh, in, uh, in 1968, uh, I had gone up in the spring to Washington for the annual gridiron celebration. And I, you know, it's white tine tails and and I got up there and as I usually did, I called him and said, What's going on? What are you doing? Can we get together? And he said, I can't have dinner. I'm getting ready to leave this afternoon for Des Moines. Uh, I'm gonna make a speech for the governor, Hughes, who's getting ready to run for the Senate. And after that, I'm going to fly to Delano, California, and Cesar Chavez and I are going to, he's going to break his fast at communion during Mass. And he said, look, you've seen gridirons. Uh, why don't you just come on and go with me? And I had not unpacked my bag. My, my tie and tails were still in the bag. And I said, fine. Meet you at the airport. And uh, Governor Hughes had had his plane fly in to take us. And we flew out to Des Moines. And Peter Edelman from, from his Senate staff and John Riley, who was later or who was then a member of the Federal Trade Commission, had been in charge of U.S. attorneys during the Kennedy administration. So the three of us were with him, and Peter had been pushing him hard to run against Lyndon Johnson for president. And John Riley sort of chimed in on that, and they began to pressure him soon after the takeoff. And I 
came in on the other side and said, don't do it, that's stupid. Uh, don't enter into a campaign you can't win. There's no way you can unseat a sitting president uh, at a convention, uh, and they know it, and they don't even claim you can win, and you don't like Lyndon, and Lyndon doesn't like you, and that's longstanding, and if you get in, you'll lose the nomination to him, and what's that to brag about? And my suggestion was that he spend that same year campaigning for uh, Democrats in marginal districts, and I said, you're popular, and you'll be able to help them, and, you know, you're a very young man, and uh, you can be president of the United States, but you can, that was my argument, and I thought it was a logical argument, and Peter and John didn't make any pretense that Bob could beat the president. Uh, they just said, Gene McCarthy is not a worthwhile candidate. He won't be a good president, and, uh, and you ought to get into this. So we argued it all the way to Des Moines. After the dinner that night, uh, we went up into Governor Hughes' suite and argued it again. Riley went back to Nashville. We flew down to Delano to meet Caesar. And Peter and I argued again. And Bob, amazingly, during this period, was very quiet. He'd ask questions, but as always, he was asking a question to get a candid answer. And I mean, we're on opposite sides. We know that one of us is gonna gonna lose, but you can't think about that if you tell him what you really think. And I think that I was right. I I. I I had no idea Lyndon Johnson would bail out in the middle of the uh, when he could run again for re-election, and uh, so we get to Delano. Drivers meet us, take us out to Caesar's place. We go into this little, almost an adobe hut, dark lights. Caesar was on a cot and had a, a votive candle and the vir a statue of the Virgin at the foot of his bed. Now, he was in charge of the uh, labor. Cesar Chavez was in charge of the, uh, the farm workers union right. in yeah. California okay. and was on a fast because um, the uh, farmers wouldn't recognize the union. And <clears throat> so we walk into that darkened, room, and uh, his wife and Dolores Huertes, who was his second in the labor union, were there, and we came over, and uh, they came and met us and took us across maybe 25 feet, or yards to where Cesar was. And Bob says, Cesar, how goes the strike? And Chavez says, not the question, Bobby. The question is, how goes the campaign? And I said to myself, shit, I lost this fight just right now. And the next day, <clears throat> we flew down to LAX, LAX, to Los Angeles, and got out at the private uh, airplane. Uh, and he, his plane was going to be delayed um, he was leaving later that night to go back to New York, and I was going back to Nashville, and I, he said, I'll walk around the plane with you. And so we walked around together, and, uh, and he said, uh, I appreciate everything you said. I know you're telling it just as the way you see it, and I understand the logic of what you're saying. But to tell you the truth, I want you to know this. I'm going to be much more comfortable doing this than if I don't do it. And I thought, well, uh, Peter won, but he had Caesar to help him, you know. 
So I went home, and he said, I'll be in touch with you. But he wasn't. He announced. I didn't hear from him until a few days after he announced. And he said, I'm coming to uh, Tuscaloosa and Speed, Alabama. i got to show that I can draw a crowd in, in the South. And I said, fine. And so we go to... Uh, he goes to Tuscaloosa, comes to Nashville, speaks to Impact Vanderbilt, packed Vanderbilt gymnasium, major turnout. And then afterward, he came to the house. You might have been there. I don't know. He came to the house for a uh, for a discussion. About a hundred people came out to our place on Vaughn Road, and we packed into the house. And, and uh, after the crowd left. Uh, he sat down in the living room, and everybody sort of stood, and some of them sat on the floor. I'll tell you one interesting thing about that night. Um, Maxie Jarman, later a Republican candidate, or maybe previously a Republican candidate for governor, and a, a business mogul nationally, Maxie Jarman came and pledged his support to Robert Kennedy for president that year. and. Um, I had asked Cecil Branstetter, who had represented the Hoffa defendants, to come. And Cecil had been on the other side of that and didn't know how Robert Kennedy felt about him and didn't really know how he felt about Robert Kennedy. And he said, no, I don't think I'll come. Uh, and then his wife called, Charlotte called back and said, well, Cecil might come. And uh, so after we had spoken, uh, after Bob had spoken to the crowd while he was sitting in the living room, uh, we got up to go, and suddenly we were f faced with Cecil Branstad, and they embraced. And Bob said, Cecil Branstad, patron of hopeless cases. And I thought Cecil might cry. I mean, it was uh, it was a very warm exchange between uh, a great lawyer, and Cecil was a great lawyer, uh, and the Attorney General, now Senator. And uh, so then uh, he asks me that night. We go for a long. Run, asks me if I come to work in the campaign, and I say yes. And. Uh, I don't want to go. I don't need to go. But I take a month's vacation and uh, in May and go out to San Francisco and manage Northern California. His brother-in-law, Steve Smith, managed Southern California. And we worked together very closely. And um, Bob was in and out of there regularly, you know, every week. And uh, finally, uh, I say to him, uh, <clears throat> in 1960, when Jack was running, uh, he asked me if I would come to Hyannisport with John Jay. And I said, our campaign uh, and the vice president's campaign were on the same floor. But even then, there was little dissension between the two campaigns because the convention had not been the friendliest of all, you know. And the shock had been that Lennon had said he would run with Jack. So I, I, uh, I said to him in 60, you're going to need somebody to stay here in the Washington headquarters on election night and make sure this celebration is real and that we join with the people from the Johnson campaign who've been a little distance. And I said, well, you know, so I'd like to stay here. And I did stay there. In, in 68, eight years later, he says, are you coming down? We're going to win California. And the polls indicated we would. Uh, are you going to come down? And I said, no, I'm going to stay up here. What I would like very much uh, is if you would send A. Kennedy, uh, Teddy, or one of your sisters up here so we can have a celebration that night after 
you celebrate. And so Teddy came up, and about five that afternoon, we had a conversation with him, and Northern California was going comfortably for him, Southern California going overwhelmingly for him. Uh, Gene McCarthy had some real roots in Northern California in that liberal academic community, but we finally broke through on that. Um, uh, and, and won Northern California. And so we said, you make your speech and we will, when you get through, Teddy will thank everybody up here and then we'll come down and see you late tonight. And uh, um, so Teddy came, we were at the Fairmont Hotel had a police escort down that night, and we stood off stage. I mean, a packed house, and, uh, and we watched television as Bobby accepted, and then said, uh, "On to Chicago." New York was the next primary, but he was talking about on to the convention. And when he left the camera, a fellow named Roger Boaz, who was our campaign manager in San Francisco, introduced Teddy. And of course, while Teddy was while Teddy was speaking, Bob was killed or shot. And uh, when it was through. Uh, we had come with police escort, but in different cars, and I said to Teddy, I'll see you back at the hotel and we'll have a drink. And Dolores and John Michael and my mother were there. And when I got to our car, they were already in it, and I got in, and they were crying. And the radio was on, and uh, you could hear the, you could hear the, uh, the announcer saying what had happened, and uh, so we drove back to the hotel. And by the time we got there, Teddy had been in touch with the Air Force, and uh, Dolores packed a quick bag for me. And Teddy and I flew down that day. Dolores and John Michael and my mother drove down the next day to Los Angeles, and we got down there. Uh, we got down there before. Uh, we got down there before Bob died. I mean, but he was, you know, he was on the machine, and they were. Well, it was a terrible day. Keep him alive until after brain surgery, you know. And you were one of his pallbearers, were you? I was one of his pallbearers. Did you take some time off after that? I tried not to, uh, but I couldn't focus on, anything. you know. Lightning strikes twice. I mean, you know, and, and the, not just Jack and Bob. I mean, Martin King Luke. dies five weeks before Bob. In April, the brightest yeah. lights of the future snuffed out. Riots in that's five there. weeks, you know, and then terrible rioting. And uh, anyway, it was it was those were uh, I when I got when I got back. Uh, Eamon Evans uh, said. Do whatever you want to do. If you want to take a month off and take a trip, go to Europe. And I said, I really need to get back involved here. I really need to get back and do something to get my. Get well, this two or three back. members of, of Kennedy's staff actually came to Nashville to be close to you, I assume. Yep. Secretaries and whatever. Right. Uh, well, let me ask you about some other people Go ahead. That, that, that you met. You, you met and worked with some interesting people besides Bob Kennedy and all these other people you mentioned. I mean, uh, Attorney General Archibald Cox, you worked with him, did you? Yeah, Archie was Solicitor General. Uh, Sarge helped recruit some of the people that Bob put around him. I mean, he goes into the office knowing that the charge of nepotism is going to hit him. He goes into office as Attorney General knowing that there's not a single um, there's not a single leader 
of the American Bar Association uh, who doesn't know that he's never tried a case in court. He's been a, he's been a government, been a Senate lawyer, a lawyer for Senate committees or Senate commissions. And he knows he's got to surround himself with people who know, who have the reputation uh, for leadership of the bar. And so, <clears throat> so he asks Byron White, who was a leader of the American Bar Association, to come on board as his deputy attorney general. And uh, they called him from his house. And uh, his wife, Marion, Byron's wife, Marion, was on the phone, and Ethel was on the phone with Bob. And Bob said to him, um, I know uh, Jack has offered you Secretary of the Army but I'd like to have you as Deputy Attorney General. And I think Byron uh, won his seat on the United States Supreme Court by his immediate response, which was, Bobby, the action's going to be where you are, and that's where I want to be. And he helped in a major way with recruiting those people that Bob Kennedy surrounded himself. Not Archie. Archie, Archie was working in the campaign. And he wanted to be Solicitor General, which he thought was the best job. He told about it one time, you know, I'd rather be Solicitor General than Attorney General. Byron was the Deputy Attorney General. Uh, Ramsey Clark was the head of the Lands Division. Nick Katzenbach, who later became Attorney General and later worked in the State Department, um, was the Office of Legal Counsel. Burke Marshall was head of the Civil Rights Division. Uh, Bill Oreck, who later became a federal judge in California, was the head of the Civil Division, and Lou Oberdorfer later became a D.C. Uh, circuit judge, uh, was head of the Tax Division. I mean, it was, and Jack Miller, uh, who had been Robert Kennedy's friend uh, and who had represented some clients before the McClellan Committee, uh, and who later was Richard Nixon's lawyer. Jack Miller was the head of the criminal division, and uh, it was a great crowd, I'll tell you. It was just a terrific crowd. And every two weeks, we'd sit down around the table. Ed Guthman was press secretary, and I was administrative assistant. And we'd all sit around the table, and he, going into the meeting, he would have each uh, assistant to give him a list of three cases that were the top cases. and. Uh, He'd decide what we wanted to talk about on a given day. But he mostly listened. And you'd hear these great discussions between and 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 sometimes they were they were contested. I mean they were you know, they were, they were I don't call any real arguments, but there were some strong differences of opinion. Uh, and it was it was a it was a great experience to sit in that room for Guthman and me to sit in that room. And listen to those to, to those arguments. I remember there had been a leak in the Defense Department, and the president had directed that uh, there be an investigation to find out where the leak came from. And there was suggestion beyond that that all departments henceforth should refer all questions to the press secretary of the department. And uh, we began to discuss that. Byron strongly wanted to do it. Ed Guthman, the press secretary, didn't want anything to do with it. And there were disagreements about what we should do and whether we should and whether we should not. Finally, Archie Cox said, Bobby, uh, Tony Lewis, the New York Times, was a student of mine at Harvard. And Tony's now covering the administration of justice and the Justice Department. And if Tony comes in to see me, to ask me, to educate him about a case that's pending, I know he's going to take it off the record. And he's not the only one. But I'm not going to send him to Ed Guthman to have Ed tell him no comment. I'm going to talk to him, and I'm going to tell him. And that's what won it. I mean, Bob said, I think Archie's right. 
Everybody just depend on your own relationship. If you need Ed, he's here. But, but it was that sort of intellectual exchange that was exciting to me to sit there and listen to. Uh, uh, Ramsey, was, Ramsey Clark, deeply interested in, uh, because he was in the lands division, in American Indians, really introduced Robert Kennedy to the reservations and took him to a couple of them, and uh, and that was another aspect of his career that uh, raised concerns for him. Uh, but just every one of those assistants in some way, Burke Marshall, the head of the Civil Rights Division, constantly was in touch with him during the problems in uh, the Freedom Rides and Ole Miss, uh, the desegregation of Ole Miss and uh, surrounded by violence. So it was it was it was an exciting thing to be part of that circle of brilliant lawyers, uh, uh, all of whom uh, primary interested in uh, enhancing the administration justice, but also at times sharply in dispute with one another over cases and issues. Griffin Bell, former attorney general and judge, yeah. he, did you meet Griffin, him later? Or? Yeah, Griffin Bell, uh, during the 60 campaign, had been chairman of the Democratic Party in Georgia. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, Lyndon was on the ticket to help with the South. But after Jack was convinced by Sarge Shriver and Harris Wofford to call Coretta King after Martin King was in, in prison, Jack made a sympathy call to her. And, uh, and um, Southerners, it hit the fan. And the next morning, Bob asked me to put a call in to every state chairman and feel their pulse. And so I called, and they were mad as hell. And I called Griffin Bell, and he was, as always, affable and funny, and said, you tell Bobby, if you're going to do this again, I could use a little advance warning. <laughs> but tell him also, we're going to carry Georgia. And there's no way that Richard Nixon is going to take Georgia away from me. And Georgia is going to be for Jack Kennedy. And of course, Jack, Georgia was for Jack Kennedy. Another interesting person uh, you got to meet and spend a little time with, I know, was uh, uh, Justice Douglas. I believe Mr. Hooker Sr. took you uh, to see him, didn't he? Yeah, that uh, <clears throat> that was a great evening in my in my life. Um, uh, Hooker Senior arranged for uh, Bill Douglas to come speak at First Presbyterian Church on Franklin Road, and Mr. Hooker called me and asked me if I would come, and I did go. And when I got there, I immediately bumped into John Jay and sat with him and Henry. And uh, after, yeah, Henry Hooker. And after dinner was over, I went to. Uh, after dinner was over, I went out to uh, Hooker Senior's house, and we spent the evening. Uh, it was a wonderful evening. Douglas and Hooker Sr. were these close pals. And, um, and Effie Hooker, John Hooker Sr.'s wife, was friendly to Douglas too. And uh, it was great just to sit there and uh, listen to the two of them talk about uh, their friendship and about careers and reminiscing. and. The thing that I really liked about Justice Douglas was that uh, he knew who I was, and uh, he and Bob Kennedy had been close friends. They spent one summer walking across the wastes of Kazakhstan, 
And uh, so we were able to talk about, about Bob Kennedy. And, of course, by that time, uh, Hooker Sr. had convicted Hoffa. So it was, it was a wonderful evening, and, uh, and I really loved it. And, and, and I, I, I communicated with Justice Douglas a couple times after that. Um, and uh, he always remembered it and said, yeah, you're, you're, you're Hooker's friend. You've known all these great legal icons for, for so many years, decades. And you've got this young grandson, Jack, who's charismatic. He's a great speaker. And I think he really wants to be a lawyer. If, if he asked you, what, what would you tell him are, are the attributes of these great legal icons that you've mentioned? Is there a common thread that runs I, I through I tell that? you, the, the, uh, the truly great lawyers that I've been around, I think, had one, had one common characteristic. They understood themselves. They knew why they were doing what they were doing. They understood uh, the complexities of the administration of justice, and uh, and they knew they were bound by an ethical code that was demanding. Uh, and they had come to grips with uh, how every the question of how every human being was entitled to. A, to a lawyer, and they had resolved the issues in their own minds. Now, it might, some of them might have come to different conclusions about it, but I remember Jim Neal uh, talking once at a, we were, we were on a panel together at a seminar, and uh, he was asked that question about uh, what is, what's the most meaningful rule you follow to be successful? And, and Jim said, well, uh, I know myself and I know my law partners, and I really think he was talking about himself. And, and I, 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 I just think about Norman and, and about Hooker. Uh, and about all those people in the Justice Department. And they had personal insecurities, and personal questions, and personal doubts. But the one thing they had a hand on the rudder uh, and an eye on the star for was the practice of law. And they understood what their role was, and they understood what the boundaries were, and what lines they would not cross. And uh, and so I, I think it was, in a, in, a, in a different way, Hal, that's sort of saying uh, they understood about the need for an independent judiciary and their role in the administration of justice under an independent judiciary. They knew that, that judges, federal judges, were beyond being touched. Uh, state judges beyond being touched and um, and beyond politics, believe it or not, even though every judge is a product of political appointment or election, uh, the great lawyers I know understood what the independent judiciary was about and how 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 the whole fabric of society really depended upon their practice before independent judges, independent-minded judges who were going to be fair and see that the administration of justice did the right thing by litigants in their court. And I, you know, I'm sure I could think of, <clears throat> of other things, but the one common denominator is I think all of them understood it. I'd put Tommy Osborne in that, too. Uh, you know, nobody regretted his crime more than than Tommy Osborne, and, uh, and, and, and certainly the, the lawyers I've talked about 
uh, or, or have dealt with prosecutors, defense lawyers. Um, they were all the same. And I would go through the federal judges I've known, um, not only those who are sitting now, but all the way back to Miller and to Gray and to Clure Morton. Um, I mean, I, I, th I think back to the only time I had a libel case go to trial. Um, we were sued for libel by Earl McNabb, a great lawyer in Jack Norman's law firm. And uh, it was over a vote scandal in which we were clearly right, two people going to prison. But we said that McNabb, as an official of the Democratic Party, had put the stamp of approval on vote fraud. And he sued us over that, and the case went to the jury. All the judges in Davidson County, knowing that Tennessean was there and that Earl was practicing in the courts, all the judges recused themselves. And, uh, and so the trial had to, be, uh, had to be heard before Judge Shepard from East Tennessee. And he flew in and uh, represented us in, in that case. And uh, the only other case that I thought came close to going to trial was one in which a man from Mississippi named uh, Hooper was selected by President Ford to be a TVA board member. And a reporter for us named Nat Carwell, a great reporter, Pulitzer Prize winner, Nat had exposed some corruption in, in Hooper's life, and the Senate committee rejected him. And he sued us. Uh, Bill Willis, Al Knight, um, and Lamar Alexander represented us. Nat wanted an independent counsel and picked Lamar. And uh, it was a uh, it was <laughs> it was a terribly worrisome case because Nat had never been sued before. He was seventy years old and very insecure about dealing with lawyers. And so uh, we had one disastrous deposition up there uh, and another, and, and Nat got sick in the middle of the deposition. We finally had to go down to Columbus, Mississippi for the deposition. And it was, it was a real ordeal. But the outcome of the case was that Clure Morton found that uh, what Nat Caldwell had done had been um, deserving of a claim and was in the highest traditions of American journalism. And so it, uh, because of an independent judiciary, I, I think I had a great career as a journalist. Every time we were sued, we were sued many times. Uh, we won them all, but the only really tough ones were those two. And uh, I look back on that with great respect for the lawyers involved on both sides, and great respect for the judges. John Zinkenthal, you've had a great ride. I thank you so much for agreeing to this interview, and, <coughs> and I, I thank you for what you've done in your lifetime. Thank you. Thank you, Al. Hal. <laughs> Hal.